The room was pitch black at this time. Then he turned on the lights and blanketing the walls were all of these devices. And I realized I had every reason to be afraid of the dark. It was a room to torture somebody in. Hello, Alicia. Hi. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you wanna watch this episode with no ads, completely uncensored, because let's face it, this episode is gonna have a lot of censorship, click the join button down below to become a member. Anyway, you were the first widely reported internet-related child abduction victim. I had you on a few years ago mm -hmm. on the I Spent Today with Kidnapping Survivors episode. First, can you explain the story of what happened? Last time, we didn't get to get into all the details, and I feel like people really wanted to know more about you and your story. So this was back in 2002, mm -hmm. and the internet was so different. And some of your viewers may remember that. I mean, gosh, do you remember the sound of dial-up? You mean... <laughs> exactly, so it was so different. And there was no internet safety education. Nobody knew how dangerous it was. And when I first got online, it felt like it was this middle school utopia. It was before kids were even cyberbullying. It hadn't gotten yeah. to that point yet. Mm. And all the popular kids were talking to the not so popular kids. And it was just this like perfect little club treehouse kind of thing. And it wasn't that we weren't certainly inviting our parents into our little secret world, but yeah. they physically could not figure out how to get into it. <laughs> so online, talking to my friends from school, feeling super safe. They're introducing me to their friends and their friends and their friends. And now it's strangers, but all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And somehow through this process, I was introduced to somebody who I thought was a boy around my own age. He begins talking to me, and what I don't realize is that he was grooming me. So what does that look like? So grooming is so simple, and I, people really try to stretch it out into these scientific terms and all of this, but grooming is really just pretending to be just a child's friend. Mm. Telling them what they want to hear versus what they need to hear. Just gaining trust? Gaining trust, but also seeing them for who they really are. And a predator's goal is to make them feel like they are enough. So they give you something and that something is this empowerment, this feeling that you are enough mm -hmm. as you are. But you don't realize that the feeling is this kind of warped perception that they're giving you that it's because of them, that the source of you feeling enough is them. What's well, pure manipulation. It's really easy to manipulate people when you're just gonna tell them what they wanna hear. The other thing about grooming is it really is like brainwashing. The whole point of brainwashing is to get you to essentially be somebody else and do things that you wouldn't typically do. Looking back, the night that I was kidnapped, I did something that was so completely out of my character. This goes on for nine months. Yes. What happened at the end of that nine month period? We're having a family meal. It's New Year's Day, 2002. Looking back at that moment, I'm smiling because that was the moment before everything in my life changed. If choices were made differently at this point, this may have never happened to me. And I hold on to that as like the moment before we said grace and it was the last moment of grace in our lives. My mom, um, she gets up and she's about to make dessert. I look at her and I say, mom, my tummy hurts. Can I go upstairs and lie down? And instead of going upstairs to lie down with my sad tummy ache, I sneak out of the front door past the Christmas tree that was up and into the coldest, darkest, iciest night that you can imagine. And I never went outside alone after dark. And on this night, completely out of my character, walked out of my front door. I was just popping outside to say hello to my friend. Does that make sense? Not really. It's but it seems good. innocent That's enough, it, right? It is innocent. You were, you were told that he was just gonna come over, say hi real quick, and you were gonna pop right back inside. Yeah, I was just going outside for a moment. I walk up the street just about a block or so. And if I turn around, I can see my house. And this is my neighborhood, so I feel pretty safe and there's nobody there and it's so quiet snow has this ability to be very deafening right and very peaceful and in that peaceful quiet moment i heard this little voice and it said alicia what are you doing turn around go home this is dangerous and i listened to it and i went to turn around and then i heard my name being called and sometimes I still hear that, that him saying my name. Was it a, a voice that you expected? No. The next thing I knew, I was in a car and this man was squeezing my hand so tightly that I thought it was broken. 
and he was barking commands at me, be good, be quiet, the trunk's cleaned out for you. And he made me look in the back seat, and in the back seat there was a bag with a bunch of ropes and chains and stuff like that in it. And when he said he was put me in the trunk, I believed him. Immediately I knew I was no longer in control of my life, and if I did the wrong thing, he would put me in the trunk. And I think Sopranos was very popular at the time, and I remember bodies going into trunks. Like, mm. people don't come out of trunks alive. And that grooming was just to get you outside of your house because the facade completely was shattered the moment that he grabbed your arm. Right. I watched the street signs go from familiar to not recognizing them at all to the moment that he hit a toll booth. So I had the surge of hope that once he got up to that toll booth, I would be able to scream out to this person and I thought that this person in this toll booth would recognize this little girl crying in the front seat and I would be rescued. And I kept this hope and this hope and this hope. And then the money was exchanged, the gate went up and he kept on his way and each time like a toll booth would happen, it was just this constant, just helplessness. He drove about five hours from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I lived, to Virginia. And I remember next the sound of the car stopping and him dragging me out of the car and pulling me into this house and down a flight of stairs that, it was really just like a flight of stairs into a basement, but in my mind it was this winding, crazy labyrinth that I would never find my way out of. And there was this wooden door with a padlock on it and he opened up the padlock, opened up the door, pushed me inside and followed him behind and propped me up on this table. He picked me up like I weighed absolutely nothing and I was very tiny and he was so much bigger than I was. And the room was pitch black at this time. And I already told you I was afraid of the dark. And I sometimes wonder if he knew that and that's something he was playing off of. But he made me look at him and he said, this is going to be really hard for you. It's okay if you cry. And then he turned on the lights and blanketing the walls were all of these devices. And I realized I had every reason to be afraid of the dark. It was a room to torture somebody in. We tend to call these kind of people monsters and what they do is monstrous, that they get pleasure from hurting others. And there's hardly, I can't really think of anything more sick and, and disturbed and awful than that. In any interview you ever see me and I will not say his name and you would not get it out of me if you asked. It was absolutely not, I used to call him the monster. And then I realized that yes, he did something monstrous, but if we call them monsters, we're making them almost supernatural. Mm. We're making these terrible, awful people something that maybe we can't fight mm. or that would be so hard to fight. And really they're just puny little evil humans. Mm. But of course I didn't feel like that at the time. After he had said that turn on the lights and I looked at all of these awful, devices, he then removed all of my clothing, put a locking dog collar around my neck with another padlock, and raped me for the first time. Over the next four days, I was raped and beaten and tortured in that basement. He broke my nose in one of the struggles, and I learned very quickly that fighting him was not the way to get out again. I was, I was very tiny and very weak and and not very strong, he was never going to take me home. And I knew that. So my only power I had, the only way that I possibly could fight back was really by not fighting, was by doing anything and everything I had to do to survive, no matter how humiliating or brutal or disgusting or painful. Because I knew that the minute I was of, and I hate to say it, but I, I don't have another way to say this, of, of no use to him, and the minute I was too much trouble, he was going to kill me. One of the things that instinctively, for whatever reason, popped into my head was that he sees you as an object. And if you can make him see you as a human, it will be harder for him to kill you. On the last day, which I didn't know was the last day, he said, I'm beginning to like you too much. Tonight we're going to have to go for a ride. And I realized that at that point he was becoming attached. 
and it was going to be harder for him to get rid of me. And so that morning, he fed me for the first time. And then he left for work. For the first time, I was alone and I was with my thoughts. And what kept me going was my family and that I knew that they were looking for me. And I had this idea, and I think so many kids do, that like your parents really are superheroes. And I knew that they would find me mm -hmm. if it meant that they had to go wake the president up and steal Air Force One. Yeah. They were going to go do that. And then it went to... When was the last time I told my parents that I really loved them? I wouldn't be there for them when they needed me most. That he would take my life and maybe they would find my body, maybe they wouldn't. But I wouldn't be there to comfort them. I wouldn't be there for them. And that's when I felt more powerless than anything ever in the world. That there are, there are no words for that. Hours had passed by. And I drifted off, and I don't mean to sleep, but just disassociated. When something is so terrible, your brain and your body sometimes are just like, I'm gonna get you away from here to a happy place. And that's what happened. I just floated away. And I was brought back to awareness by these voices and these people who sounded really quite angry and screaming something about having a gun. And I heard the door crash in. I could hear people breaking into this house. And in my completely confused, hopeless, broken mind at this point, I thought he had sent people to kill me. So I heard, clear, 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 clear. Today I'd be like, oh, hey, that's the police. I right. would have watched SVU for, right? Like I'd have this concept. I didn't know then. And I knew that these people were looking for something and I figured it was me to kill me. So I rolled underneath the bed to try to hide from them. And I stayed as quiet as I possibly could. I put my hand over my mouth and just total fear. And I must have made some sort of noise because I heard this man say, movement over there. And I watched these, he had regular sized feet, but in my mind, he had like a giant and these giant feet walked from the side of the bed that he was standing onto the side that I was hiding under and like thump, 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 thump. And he stopped and he said, crawl out and put your hands up in this very forceful, scary voice. And I remember crawling out from underneath of that bed, dragging that cold, heavy chain behind me, trying to cover myself because I had no clothing on and raising my hands and staring at the end of a gun and thinking that this is it. This is the moment I'm going to die. But then he turned around and I saw that it was law enforcement by what was written on the back of his jacket. And all these officers and agents rushed into that room, cut the chain from around my neck with the jaws of life. So they set me free and they gave me a second chance at life. And I'm so incredibly lucky to be here. And people have said that to me since the moment I was rescued. You're so lucky, you're so lucky, you're so lucky. And every time I say it, I even realize more so how lucky I am. Because this wasn't a day and age where they could have tracked my cell phone mm -hmm. or my Apple Watch or that there were even really any records of anything. And my rescue was an absolute miracle. While he had me, he had been live streaming what he was doing. And somebody who was watching this because they wanted to watch it, recognized me from my National Center for Missing Exploited Children poster that had been sent out. Somehow, he was able to recognize the little girl in this horrendous video as the little girl in the missing poster. And it led to my rescue. They were able to track down his IP address. That person reached out to the FBI, had very little information, but he did have one of the screen names that the perpetrator used that they were able to track the IP address to the house that I was being held captive in. And really, it was one horrible person coming forward about another. And it makes me think something, though, that look at the good that came out of that. Somebody doing something good for the wrong reason, which was to protect themselves, because now they were involved in all of this. And if he'd killed me, it wouldn't go well for them either. But you had somebody who was doing the right thing, quite possibly for the wrong reason. 
So think about how much good doing good can do, how much more powerful that is. I learned that there is so much bad, there is so much evil, there's so much cruelty in this world, but I've learned that there is so much more good. But good has to speak up, good has to stand up, good has to be louder. It's easy for evil to be loud. So good has to be bigger and brighter and stronger than the evils of the world. So that's why we have to stand up and we have to do what is right because good doing good is so powerful. Do you remember when you first saw your parents after getting out? After I was rescued, I stayed with, for the evening, a family. They probably will see this or something, and I was worried about that because they were so, so lovely mm -hmm. that they were too lovely. They made me so sad because I thought that I would never have that again. That evening, I was told that my parents would be up to get me. Of course, they start walking, right? <laughs> my parents would be up to get me, and I sat up that entire night waiting for them, and they didn't show up. And I remember thinking, my mom would always tell me, there's nothing you could ever do that would make me stop loving you. And I was thinking, this has to be the one thing that my parents no longer love me and they no longer want me. And when I woke up the next morning, I was told that my parents were unable to get on a commercial flight because the media attention had been so intense so that they were flying them up on a private jet. And they take me to this tiny little private airport in Virginia. And I can remember my parents walking in and my mom was behind my dad. My dad ran up to me and I'm so close to my mom. My mom and I like finish our sentences and we're so, so close. But my dad ran up to me and he hugged me. And he's been quoted in the newspaper, which is so funny, as saying that if you could duplicate this hug all over the world, there would be no more wars. No. Which is so cute. It's such a dad. Thing. Isn't that yeah. so sweet? But it really was because in that moment we were safe. Up until that point, I had been surrounded by law enforcement and people who would probably protect me very well, but nobody was going to protect me like my dad. And in that moment, the nightmare really ended. It was an incredibly emotional moment. Uh, pure joy. I mean, imagine you're hanging off of a cliff and you know you're going to fall, but somehow you get picked up and the people who can make sure this never happens again are, are right there for you. Mm -hmm. It was a miracle and it was, it didn't feel real. That also felt surreal. Mm. And for quite a while, honestly, anytime I would wake up, I would be really afraid that my life up until that point had been a dream. Mm. I still sometimes think that, I'm like, it's been a really long dream at this point. Right. But well, what if? Is it the dissociation? Is it? Just, it's so unbelievable. How could this happen to someone, especially you? I, I tell my story so much. And honestly, it, I don't want to say it's harder to tell today, but it is it is in some ways. Because I have healed so much. Mm. Back then, I would say it, and I, it was like I was in a storm. But now I'm in the sunshine, and I'm happy, and I have to go back into the storm and realizing how miraculous this really all is. And everything fell into place for a lot of reasons and it's nothing short of a miracle. So what was the hardest part after being rescued of assimilating back into your normal life afterwards? Or was there a normal life to even go back to? There isn't. Uh, and I don't want to say that for everybody. Some people may be rescued and they wake up and it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for me, there was nothing normal to go back to. We had, as a family, gone through war. My bedroom, even though it looked exactly the same, was different. That front door that I walked out of, walking back into it, was different. Everything was different and everything became, this is the first time I'm doing this again. It's, it's, all these firsts again, it's, it's very interesting in the healing process. For me, I really thought that I would have some nightmares and maybe some flashbacks, and I didn't realize how real it all was. You don't get better in that way. I mean, you do get better, but it doesn't go away. It's always there, but you make room for the trauma in your life. It, it's there, you carry it with you, but there's more and more room to carry it in. 
And when you really start to heal is when those nightmares or the flashbacks, which can happen immediately or 20 or 30 or 40 years later, it's that they don't bring you down for the day, mm. that you bounce back quicker to your healed point. Do people blame you or your parents for you being in that situation? There was a lot of victim blaming and it was difficult for me because when I talk about like making good choices, I walked outside and it took me a long time to not feel guilty for that and to forgive myself. And the fact that it was four days, you mentioned that yes. people were like, oh, only four days. Oh, I thought this was one of the really bad cases. It was just four days of complete and utter torture. That was something that was really difficult too because people would ask me that and how long were you kidnapped? And I'd say four days and that is really how they would respond. And I didn't have an answer. If you five fall from 5,000 feet or 500 feet, you're still gonna hit the ground just as hard. Mm. Again, it's not what happens to us. It's how it impacts us. And we can't, we can't compare traumas and say, well, this happened to me and it was worse, or this happened to me and it's not as bad. Pain is pain. And it's not what happened. Again, it's how it impacts you and what it means to you. You went into a courtroom and you had to see your abductor face to face. And I can't go without thanking BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Therapy has helped reframe my view of the world and myself by allowing me to feel empathy for my younger self and therefore understand who I am today better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in helping with motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp screens all their therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're certified and licensed and provide customized therapy that offers video, phone and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone or even speak over the phone if that's not something that you're comfortable with. One of the most difficult parts of starting therapy for me was finding a therapist that I actually connected with. And that price can start to get overwhelming, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. So with that said, huge thank you to BetterHelp who are giving I Spent Today with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's better H-E-L-P dot com slash Padilla. And I'd also like to thank DoorDash for sponsoring this episode. Maybe you're like me and you have no idea what to eat until you're too hungry to function. Well, DoorDash connects you with everything you want whenever and however you want it. And yes, we all know that DoorDash delivers your restaurant favorites straight to your door, but now you can also get groceries delivered as well. And there are thousands of grocery stores to choose from, so you find the best one in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. And for a limited time, viewers and listeners of the show will get 50% off your first DoorDash order, up to $20 value, when you use code Padilla at checkout. That's a limited time offer in terms apply, of course. That's 50% off, up to $20, with no minimum subtotal and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code Padilla. And I'm only going to say this one more time, okay? That's code Padilla for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Now, back to the world of Alicia Kozak. You went into a courtroom and you had to see your abductor face to face. How old were you at that time? I was either 15 or 16 when the trial actually happened. Now, he did a plea bargain, so he gets a lesser sentence of 19 years and seven months, but I went in and I did a victim impact statement, and I was put on the stand, asked questions. I was told that day that this would be very empowering for me and that I would be able to stand there and say, you hurt me and you're going to feel so strong, and I didn't. I felt awful. I had moved on at that point. I actually went from that uh, testimony to, I think it was like homecoming football game night mm. and I did flag corps and I went and performed. Like yeah. my life had started to rebuild and that felt like going backwards. Years later, he was released early, two years early. Found this out through a reporter in Pittsburgh who messaged me and was like, hey, just wanted to let you know, are you aware that so-and-so, again, I not say his name, but so-and-so has been released and he's four miles from your parents' house. Did anybody tell you this? No, we were not informed. And you're supposed to be informed. The question immediately was, did he choose to be put there? Mm. And I found out that he had been there for months and he didn't have an ankle monitor on. And all of these things where quite honestly, the system failed. And then I had posted about this, there had been news stories about it, and I had a bunch of survivors reach out to me 
and say, hey, this is happening to me. The person who abused me, they're my neighbor. I was driving through the neighborhood and I looked over at the car and the person who abused me was in the car next to me. This was actually very common or somewhat common at least. And they said, if you can change this, if you can stand up, you have a voice, you have a platform, maybe it'll make a difference for me. Mm. And that's what gave me the strength. So I reached out to my lawyer and I said, is there anything I can do? Can I do some sort of testimony and speak to the judge? Not having any idea that because he was a free person, he would have the choice to be in that room or not. And he made that choice. So I, oh, that, that day I, I wrote, I wrote my testimony that morning. I just like, yeah. and I just let out everything. And the judge was standing in front of me and I had my back turned and he was on the other side of the room and my parents were behind him. And I remember thinking who could get to me first. When I left that room though, I had that feeling that they told me I was gonna have years ago. I felt empowered. Oh. I chose to be there that time and it was for a good reason. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I had to be. It was because I was standing up for my family and I was protecting them, but I was also speaking up for all of these people whose offenders were released into their communities. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that's what gave me the strength to do it. So how do you navigate that knowing that he is out there? He is free to make decisions and do what he wants. I had to learn that that's not my responsibility. You don't hold on to that thought? No, it's not. I don't have any power over that. It wasn't my job to sentence him. My only job now is to live my life. It did bother me at first when I would think about him waking up and putting on shoes and just being a person and going outside and getting fresh air and enjoying a sandwich. I, him, and then I have to stop. Mm because in the scheme of things, it, it doesn't matter. Because something people ask me all the time, and this is possibly quite important. I remember one of my presentations, somebody came up to me like, have you forgiven him yet? <laughs> I don't have to forgive him. Nobody has to forgive anybody. I get that you don't want to carry the anger. You don't want to carry yeah. the rage. You want to let it go. It's just that I refuse to let it matter. When people ask me what has helped me to heal, it would really be a large part due to my advocacy, mm -hmm. that I gave this horrible, awful thing that happened to me a purpose and a reason. There's this saying, which I'm sure you're well aware of, that things happen to us for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it was very comforting. And now I've been speaking in schools for, mm -hmm. for 20 years, and you're brought up in the presentations often. They bring me up now? They do, it is the <laughs> coolest thing. Like I'll have like, and it's typically boys, they'll raise their hand. I have a question for you, I have a question for you. Were you on Anthony Padilla? <laughs> I saw you on Anthony Padilla. It's it's really amazing. And it was another reason why I wanted to come out and speak with you about the danger that kids are facing because they are listening. We teach kids to look both ways before they cross the street. The street. We teach them to not touch the pot because it's hot. But when it comes to predators, parents are uncomfortable to talk to their kids. Mm. And we need to change that because the second that they're on that device, they're at risk. Predators are so incredibly good at what they do and the predator image, the person that the people who are predators has changed so much that when you ask a kid, because I do this, I'll say, okay, who describe a predator for me? And they'll say, an old man. Recently they said an old man in his thirties. <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> but then I did realize that the predator was in his late 30s, so they are right. But the fact is that just like anybody can be a victim, anybody can be a predator. And what I really want kids to know now is that the predators are getting younger and younger and younger. They don't need to catfish. They don't need to pretend to be somebody else. That is their real social media. But what they're hiding, and we hinted at this before, is their intentions. They're going to be wherever the kids are because that's their intended target. They're not going mm -hmm. to go somewhere else. And there's some really interesting ways in which they're grooming kids now. I've heard of children being groomed on the Bible app. 
Uh, Which is the, they go to the places where it seems the least likely for a predator to be. And that's the thing too, is that predators are so far ahead of the kids. So we have like the predators who are here and the kids who are falling behind and law enforcement is way back here and parents are like, oh, yeah. it's, it's really tricky. And that's why we have to teach the kids predator goals have changed as well. This next thing that I'm going to talk about, which is sextortion. Mm. Every child is at risk for this. Mm -hmm. Every single child will most likely have to make a choice at some point to send a photo or not. So that kid sends the photo and what happens very quickly is there's a couple of different ways and a couple of different kinds of predators who do this, but they will then say, well, if you don't send me more photos, here's your mom's address at work. I'm going to go talk to her. Here's your teacher, here's this, here's that. And I'm also gonna post this online. And they really will. So just getting that one photo is enough for them to have full and complete control over you. Those chains uh, of shame and fear are just as strong as the chains that held me in a basement. Those kids are just as trapped. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to talk to kids about these things. We can't expect them to know, but it's not about fear. Again, it's about empowerment. If you know it's dangerous, if you know how to protect yourself, then you can. But in the same vein, advocacy has sort of become, when people talk about healing, almost like a step in the healing process mm. that people, I'll read news stories of kids who've been recovered or something terrible has happened to really anybody. It's like, I wonder what they're gonna do with their lives and how they're gonna help people. That's not your responsibility. Many survivors are almost led to believe that it's their identity to be the, the fear-ridden exactly. survivor. Well, I have a friend who she was out at lunch and she was laughing and having a good time and her child had been missing for, I think, 17 years at this point. Mm. And people actually came up to her and were like, what are you doing laughing here? Your child is missing. Mm. Are you okay with that? Like they attacked her. Mm. And people do that. And please, like I said, don't ever, don't ever suppress your joy. If you want to laugh, laugh. It is part of who we are. It doesn't go away, mm -hmm. but it is not who you are. It is not your identity. Can you talk about the Alicia Project and Alicia's Law? Basically, the whole point of like the Alicia Project was that if this could happen to me, it could happen to you. People will say like, oh, was it on Snapchat that you met this person? Absolutely <laughs> not. The internet did not have Snapchat. It didn't even have YouTube. So talking about the internet when it happened to me and it being really different and very simple as compared to when I started talking to kids, really my message was like, you don't need to be on the internet. And they really didn't need to be then. Social media wasn't a necessary thing. It's and a it, lot more difficult now though. It is because they're on, they're, you, can you imagine if I got up in front of a bunch of 14 year olds and was like, don't get online, it's dangerous. It's literally part of their schoolwork. Exactly. And the message has changed and that's why it's really had to change to making good choices. Just try to think twice, take a pause and think, is this something I should really do? I spoke in Florida at this school and as I'm driving back, I get this email from a boy in seventh grade. And he says, you told me that you could reach, I could reach out to you if there's any questions or anything that I need. And actually, I really need your help. I was sexually assaulted last month and I don't know what to do. And I don't think I want my parents to know and help me. And of course, I can't be like, well, do this and this and this. I have to report that. So I reach out to his school counselor. By four o'clock, his mom was at the school and he had opened up to her. They were hugging it out and comforting each other and he had a therapy appointment by five. Mm. But it really shows that by speaking up and by talking to kids and giving them the ability and the permission to ask for help without shame, that they're going through so much and that they do have that outlet. That this little boy may have carried this pain, he at least carried it for that month, but what could that have turned into and what could he have struggled with, which he will still struggle, but at least he's getting the help and support that he needs. If there is anyone watching who has gone through similar things or maybe they have experienced something that they are not yet comfortable sharing with the people around them, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? Any message that you would give them? It's so difficult because a predator's goal and an offender's goal and these people's goal is to make you so feel so ashamed that you can't come forward 
that is the goal to make you feel ashamed and uncomfortable and afraid and that your parents will be mad at you and that your life will change and that you'll lose them as a friend. And that's part of the manipulation. And the thing is that no matter what choices you've made, no matter what mistakes you may have made, no matter what this person has done to you or forced you to do, it's never your fault. And that it is so important for you to come forward. No matter what, it's not your fault. And what you're going to find is support and comfort. Shame is a very difficult thing to carry. Right. And by telling it, you'll realize that you have nothing to be ashamed about. When I first started speaking to kids, MySpace had just become popular. Mm. Yes. Were you in those kids' top eight? <laughs> no. Oh. I wasn't on MySpace. Not back then. Mm. Actually, I don't think I was on MySpace at all now that I think yeah, about it. Yeah, that's probably for the best. I think I, yeah, nobody needs to be, every time, they try to bring that back every so yeah. often and we need to not ever let that happen. Yeah, that's, that's I don't want to do the, I don't want to have the top eight. It I don't want the Tom. Mm -hmm. None of us know Tom, but he's our best friend. Mm -mm. Talking about strangers, right. it's all very weird.